Hello and welcome. Tonight, the live exam prep series from the Institute of Real Estate Education located in Bountiful, Utah. We'll be going through a series of questions, about two dozen. And, uh, you know, these are concepts that you need to know to pass the real estate exam in the state of Utah, the licensing exam, the first time. We want you to pass the first time. We don't want you to have to take it again and again and again. And if you go through these live exam prep series, they're, they're going to be very helpful to you. Tonight's topic primarily is going to be ownership. And let's just jump right into the questions with us tonight. My name is Rick Roller, and I am uh, the senior instructor tonight that will be working with you. And also uh, behind the scenes, uh, running all the computers and doing all the networking and everything else that has to be done is the owner of our school, Mr. Danny Naylor. And uh, he can say hi if he wants to. But anyway, he's he's behind the scenes. He's here for the whole time. All right. Glad so, to be here. Appreciate you, Rick. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be appreciated. Let's 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 jump into the material tonight because I know I've got people that are worried about the exam and uh, and what they're going to see. You're going to see things like this. So our first question tonight is: If a real estate purchase contract is signed by both parties but the buyer finds that the contract does not accurately represent the property. What is this contract? Is it executed? Is it automatically voided? Is it unilateral? Or is it voidable by the buyer? Well, who's the harm party here? I mean, uh, the, the buyer finds that the contract did not accurately represent the property. Well, you know, they're not going to stand for that. I mean, they're, they're, and this this could mean a lot of different things. It, it could be size of the lot or, or if there's an acreage involved, it could be the zoning. It, it could be a ton of different things, okay? But, it, but the one that was harmed was the buyer. And so the correct answer to this one is B, voidable by the buyer. D is in David, voidable by the buyer, okay? Now, is it signed and executed? Well, yeah, it's signed by both parties. But, but it's not automatically voided and it's definitely not unilateral because there's promises being made two ways. Um, and executed could mean that it's finished too. So, so the best answer, guys, is voidable by the buyer because he's the one that's going to be disadvantaged. The prop, you know, it wasn't written correctly, something's wrong. It doesn't accurately describe the property. And so the buyer could let it go or the buyer could cancel a contract. Number two, please. <clears throat> hey, hope you're enjoying the video. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any more of them. And if you want even more review material, we have in the Prep My Exam link in the comments, we've got a plethora of practice exams. We have audiobooks. We have an exam simulator. We have everything that our students use to pass the exam on their first try. Okay? And if you want to get licensed in Utah, check out realestateonlinelearning.com and we'll hook you up. If a lessor and a lessee come to terms on a lease for an apartment, but after the agreement, science revealed the lessee is only 16 years old. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, they looked a lot older. But which is true? Well, the proper age in Utah in order to con contract for things is 18. So he's a little, little shy there. Um, the lessee, who is the lessee? Well, that's the tenant, right? Can void the contract. The lessor can void the contract. The contract is automatically voided. You, you know, if something is automatic, uh, it's probably going to be a wrong answer, okay? Uh, and the last one, the contract is activated. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, the lessee can void the contract. It's A, because they're, the, they're once again, uh, they didn't have the opportunity to actually contract yet. I mean, you know, they're look, I guess they got a little confused, but uh, or maybe they thought they looked old enough and could get away with it, but... Uh, but the lessee can void the contract because they don't haven't reached their majority to where they can actually contract legally. Let's go to the next question then. Three things a valid contract for land requires. Three things valid contract for land requires are a broker. Do you always have to have a broker? Can't you buy for sale by owner property or can you, uh, you know, purchase by with, with without representation as, as a buyer? Okay, well... So the broker is really not really there. Okay, consideration, offer and acceptance, and competent parties. Well, that's sounding really warm and fuzzy, isn't it? See, competent parties, tax provisions. Ah, eh, no, forget the tax provisions. D, 
a legal description of land, a broker, and a incompetent parties. Now, the trick on this one is legal description. You only need an adequate description, which could just be the common address. Uh, it's best to have the legal description in it. A lot of times you put the tax ID numbers in. But out of these four, the correct answer, three things a valid contract actually require, is B is in boy. Consideration, offer and acceptance, and competent parties. I mean, it's right out of the definition. Okay, so... Let's go to number four, here we go. Um, now, according to statute of frauds, which the statute of frauds is, is, is one of those uniform documents that's pretty much the same in most states. I mean, it may have a little bit of change here or there, but it's pretty much the same. And it really makes sense, you know, because people own property across state lines. You know, one of the, the, the largest single state that has the most out of state owners for real estate in Utah is California. And second to that is usually Idaho and Arizona are right in there as well. Uh, but right now it's California. And uh, according to the statute of frauds, which is pretty much the same in most all states, a real estate contract must be encumbered, chattel, a lien signed by both parties. Well, obviously. I don't know how you, uh, you know, with, with the statute of frauds, would have about encumbrances other than have to be written. But chattel is personal property, and a lien is well, a lien is just a an attachment of some kind, a legal attachment against the property. It could be a mechanics lien, could be a first mortgage lien. But the but the but but according to the statute of frauds, you know, a real estate contract must be D signed by both parties. I mean, obviously, you have a buyer and a seller, and they both have to agree. All right, let's look at the next one, please. The next question up is, who must sign an agreement to sell a property? This sounds like a listing agreement, doesn't it, right? All the owners, A. B, the owner with the largest share. Well, okay, that I like the fact they're going to sign it, but they need really uh, all the owners. <laughs> the owner's agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what, what are you talking about? The real estate agent? I don't know. I mean, what are you talking about? D, the owner's heir. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't have it yet, you know, unless the owner's dead. But out of all these guys, it's got to be a all the owners of the property have to sign it. Uh, and uh, this, this, this can get real interesting, particularly if you're working tenant and common agreements where, you know, there could be 16 owners or eight owners, you know, whatever it is. Many of them could be very minor owners, but the major owners, um, it, it really doesn't matter. I, if you just own 5% of this, you still have to sign everything, in, including all of the transferring documents. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Number next one is A and B, which is six. Or they're married. That's nice. They're selling their vacation home that they bought together. They have signed a purchase agreement. And it's time to close in the property. So who needs to sign the deed? <laughs> you can sign for them. You're the broker, right? No, I don't think so. Title agent can sign. No, I don't think so. A and B must both sign the deed, or either A or B can sign the deed. But wait a minute. They're married, but they bought it together. So A can't sign for B and B can't sign for A unless they have a power of attorney. So the correct answer to this one, guys, who needs to sign the deed? Both A and B have to sign the deed. And if you get into some of these ticks where, you know, the majority interest is owned by two people and then there's 10 people that own minor interest, it, you know, I mean, I've had to hop in the car and drive all the way to Southern Utah to get a lady to sign a contract. I mean, they actually signed a deed. I had to track down a notary. She's, oh, I'll come up next week, yeah, next week, next week, next week. And man, we're closing in two days. Uh, are you going to be home today? Yeah, great. I'm coming. <laughs> it took me like five hours to drive down there, four, I don't remember. Things we do to close deals. And that's that's okay. You know, we're expected to do that. We're expected to make it happen. And uh, sometimes it takes a little bit extra effort. Next question, please. All right. And this next question we have D and E. Now they're tenants in common, but they both rarely spend time in the property anymore as their lives have changed over the years. And D wants an agent to list their property. Okay. Now D could sell their piece of it if they wanted to without uh, E being involved, but it's 
hard to find a buyer that wants to buy into not just the property, but also a partnership. You don't know the other people. They don't know you. You don't know what their goals are. Well, Deacon signed listing agreements. Okay, but that's not complete. Okay, no signature is needed. <laughs> yeah, right. He can give verbal permission. Mm, I don't think so. Both D and E must sign the listing agreement. Guys, you got to go with D. Okay, they're both owners. Okay, and so it, all owners have to sign. And I don't care if D owns 95% and E only owns 5%. They still have a piece of ownership and they need to sign the deed. Okay. Would their signature be smaller than you? No, no. <laughs> their signatures are whatever their signatures are. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Here we go. A contract for the sale of property is not valid unless it has both what? Uh, offer and acceptance. No, I like that one. Signatures from the agents. Mm. Title and deed. Mm. Buyer and broker. <laughs> okay. Guys, uh, a contract for sale property is not valid unless it has both what? An offer and an acceptance. And it has to be complete. You can't say, well, we're, we're accepting everything except, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to leave the pergola. We're going to take it apart and move it off the property, you know, and take it with us. We really enjoy that pergola, you know, so. Uh, no, it, if there's even one piece of that agreement you didn't agree to, then it's a counter offer, isn't it? You don't have an offer and you don't have an acceptance. Moving along, let's go to the next one, please. Um, a real estate sales contract has been signed by both the buyer and the seller, but has not reached closing yet. Okay, so it's what we call under contract. Is it unilateral? Is it an executed contract? That means it's done, put against the wall and shot and it's all over with. A fraudulent contract or an express contract. Well, out of all these guys, you know that this is actually the definition of an express contract. It's one that's been signed by all the parties involved, but they haven't quite come to the closing yet. Most contracts will take a little bit of time to close. You know, as you're aware, if you're an active agent, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a whole month. It depends on the type of loan what work has gone on in advance uh, and um, and how good the listing agent was. You know, I mean, there are a lot of situations where um, there most title problems on a property in most situations can be handled in about two or three weeks, okay? But you have to know it exists. <laughs> you have to know that there was a problem. I mean, even I sold one of my properties years ago and I signed a, I signed the deed Rick Roller, you know, rushed in, rushed out. And that was fine until they went to refinance and found out that the owner of the property wasn't Rick Roller. It was Richard R. Roller. Well, I had to come in and sign a correction deed. Well, luckily, that was easy to do. I was well known. You know, I mean, the title company knew where I was. <laughs> so they, they, you know, we got it all put together and it was not a problem. The problem is, is when it's something where you can't find the people to sign a signature. Now, I had one I had years ago where I had a listed beautiful home on 39th South and about mm, maybe 28th East, somewhere in there. Maybe a very, very nice home. And um, she bought the home and, and, and when she, the, the owner, and, and when she had purchased the home, the sellers had carried back oh, a small uh, owner carry, uh, and then she assumed their loan. And so... Uh, so she had owned, a, uh, owned the she had owed the owners about ten thousand dollars, but she'd paid it off over the years. Okay, well, so the owners had sent her the original note, promissory note that she had, you know, that she had signed with them, indicating that she owed them money, and uh, they'd written on it, paid in full, and they sent that back. Well, that was never recorded. And even if it were, it's not what we need to record to release a lien on a property that's that's put on there with the deed of trust. You know, we we need a deed of reconveyance document signed is what we need for that. Well, when I listed the property, I immediately ordered a title commitment and we found that, uh, you know, we had a problem and we had to track them down uh, to get them to release a, a, a long paid to go, paid long ago, uh, leaned against that property. Okay, but during during the uh, express period, you know, it, it's still under contract. It's just that you're supposed to close by a certain date. So my friends, 
who are in real estate, I admonish you to order your title commitments early. And a lot of agents say, well, I don't want to order them early because there could be a cancellation fee if it didn't lead to a closing. I've never seen a cancellation fee charged in the state of Utah, but I suppose they have been. A $200 fee or whatever. Uh, my listing contract uh, that I use states that yeah, if there is a cancellation fee uh, or any other expenses involved, you know, the seller's going to pay for those, you know, and uh, whether it closes or not. So let's go to the next question, please, which is a contract is binding on both parties. Now, if it's binding on both parties, is it unilateral, one way, unilateral? Is it executed, meaning finished? Is it bilateral? Ooh, that one sounds warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? Okay, I don't know. We'll see. Is it illegal? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know, guys. I don't think it's illegal. What do you think? And I don't think it's executed because it's not finished yet. But it is binding on both parties. So it's got to be bilateral, okay? Buyer agrees to buy, seller agrees to sell. You know, and we have an agreement. And we're working out all the details as we march towards the closing. Sometimes these deals can close quickly and sometimes people need to move quickly and they want to move quickly, which is another reason why you should order your title commitments early. You just order them to be determined on the buyer because you don't have a buyer yet. And then, uh, you know, they can alter that later and then issue that out. Um, but, but they are both bound to a purchase agreement. So it's a bilateral contract. We're going to talk about a mortgage instrument next, and that is a interesting contract. A mortgage instrument is executed by whom? The owner's agent, the lending institution, the owner's heir or the owners. Well, gosh, folks, if, if, if D is not pounding its way into your consciousness, <laughs> it should be. When you get a loan against a property, the you know the, um, the lending institution wants to make dang sure you're committing yourself to that loan. They want the owners, which will be the owners, uh, sign it. Not not the heirs, and you know they're they're agreeing to it and they're supplying the money, but uh, but you have the obligation to pay, and it's not the owner's agent unless they have a power of attorney, which wasn't discussed. The only one you can go with here is the owner. And that would be the correct answer. We're on our 12th question already. And uh, the 12th question says, any contract can be rescinded if, any contract can be rescinded if. Well, the buyer backs out. Uh, the seller feels the price is too low. I shouldn't have agreed to that. Both parties agree. No, the parties are married. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Uh, scratch that D, uh, you know, we don't need that one. What about B? The seller feels the price is too low. Well, they already obligated themselves. The buyer backs out. Uh, when you rescind a contract, it, it's kind of a mutual agreement. So both parties agree. Both parties agree that they're going to rescind the contract and walk away. And there, there'll, there'll be some, uh, perhaps repercussions to that. Uh, maybe, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, it depends on how the contract was written, but both parties have to agree to one where you're rescinding it on both sides. Otherwise, it'd just be a unilateral can uh, cancellation during the buyer's probably uh, due diligence period. Okay, our next question is an interesting one. It says an agency relationship that is not in writing and is created unintentionally through the actions of the agent is called a what? Dual, proper, implied universal universal you'll, you'll hardly ever see those very often but it that's where you can do everything for someone someone has been in, in um, maybe they're in a coma you know some sort of a medical issue where they're they're not conscious and so someone has put in you know needs to be in charge of their affairs that would be a universal agent they're in charge of everything okay uh guys it's implied it's c unintentional through the actions it, it was implied that you were their agent it's not proper you should have a written agreement in fact in utah you must have a written agreement and it's not dual agency where you're representing both the buyer and the seller it's implied agency and uh it doesn't protect you and it doesn't protect them either 
and it's also in violation of the rules and regulations. Um, the rules and regulations actually state that you have to have a buyer's agreement signed before you, they enter into a REPSI. So, I mean, if you're waiting to the last possible moment, I guess you could, that'd be the first document on the stack. Let's sign this representation agreement. Okay, great. Now let's go ahead and work through the offer. And maybe there's some addendums, whatever else they, they might need. And hopefully they applied for a loan a long time ago and they're ready, you know, they're ready to go. Okay, well, that was an agency relationship that's not in writing, should have been. In fact, our rules state that, it, that uh, you know, probably about a $500 fine, maybe more, you know, it depends on what else you screwed up. But, 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 but you don't want to be in the newsletter and, and, you know, all the disciplinary actions are in the uh, real estate division's newsletter. It's a public document, and therefore they're all on the internet. So if someone is Googling your name, uh, you know, it's going to pop up and it's going to say violation. This will happen, that happened. And uh, they may or may not be uh, scared away by that. I don't know. Our next question, please, is in order to create an agency agreement to represent someone to sell their home, you must have a college degree, a letter of recommendation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, those first two don't really make sense. A deed to the property. All right or a real estate license. What do you think, gang? It's not a deed. It's not a letter of recommendation. It's not a college degree. It is the license. You have a license to represent buyers and represent sellers. You have a license to promote properties and, um, and pursue buyers. And you don't need a college degree. You, you, you don't need a letter of recommendation. You don't need a deed to the property. I mean, if you have a deed to the property, it's probably yours. But uh, anyway, that's, that's the correct answer. You need a real estate license. And that's, that's why many of you are studying in order to get a real estate license so you can represent other people and help them with their sales. Okay, let's talk about material facts for a moment. Which of the following is a material fact? Material fact is, has, you know, it's important. The seller is willing to sell for 20 grand below the list price. The land is rumored to be haunted. <laughs> That's stigmatized, but no. The house has an unconventional floor plan. Mm, that's uh, the seller is under financial pressure to sell quickly. Okay. What's the material fact? Stupid floor plan. <laughs> it's not rumored to be haunted, and it's not under financial pressure. That had nothing to do with the property. It had everything to do with the loan that the they procured the property with, but now they're defaulting on. Um, the seller, you know, they might go, they might go less, might go more. They, they might be trying to make more. We'll see. But uh, correct answer to this one, they, they want to know what is a material fact. A material fact is something that would affect the value or the purchase price. And having a weirdo floor plan will definitely do that. And um, I've seen houses with hallways that lead to nowhere. <laughs> I don't know what the purpose of that was. Uh, and all other kinds of weirdo things that you might see. Um, if it's unconventional and therefore undesirable, perhaps it would affect the, the, uh, the, the price of the home, which would be a material fact. Okay. Okay, let's do the next one, please. J Jay is a seller uh, that's hired an agent. Cool. A K is a customer who's buying the seller's house. Great. L is the mortgage broker financing the buyer. And M is the title agent will close the transaction. Lots of people on your team to, <laughs> you know, to make sure this deal closes. To whom does the agent owe their full list of fiduciary duties? Well, okay. Uh, what do you think, guys? It's got to be your client. J is the seller that hired the agent. Okay, I like that one. That's B, and that's, that's the correct answer. Uh, K is the customer who's buying the seller's house. But you, 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 know, you may or may not be representing that seller. Okay. Uh, L is a mortgage broker. I mean, yeah, they're important to the transaction, but they're not giving you the loan. They're giving it to the buyer. Uh, you don't owe them a full, full fiduciary like, like, like you do the seller here. And M is a title agent. Okay, guys, it's got to be J. It's the only one that uh, really um, 
you owe your full fiduciary. You must be fair and honest in all your dealings. You know, you, you're, the state of Utah will not allow you to cheat and rob people. I mean, that just makes sense. Um, but you, you know, it's your fiduciary, which all lawyers understand very well. I mean, after coming out of three years of mind-numbing law school, they all understand fiduciaries very well. And um, it's because of the, the, the fact that fiduciary rules are so strenuous and so uh, all-encompassing and whatnot that many states, not Utah, but many states have actually moved to a situation where you can just be classified as a deal maker. Hey, I'm just a deal maker. You know, if you want a fiduciary, go hire a lawyer, you know, um, and they'll look over all the contracts and make sure everything's done correctly uh, from their standpoint. Uh, but I, um, but that would be a full fiduciary. Okay. All right. So next one. The next question says, who can be held liable to provide material facts to potential buyers? The owner only and not the agent. Hey, whatever you know that is a material fact, it's got to be disclosed. You know, like previously we had a question where the they pro property was haunted. Well, we have a law in Utah that says that stigmatized properties like that, <laughs> that's not a material fact. So you don't have to reveal the fact there's a, you know, they get a permanent resident ghost. Um, I had a property like that where the lady had died in the home and, uh, the neighbors noticed their mail and the papers were piling up and, the, you know, they knocked on the door, no answer. Her car was in the garage, she peeked through the window, called the police. Police came, made entry, and uh, she was dead. She died in the home, had a heart attack or something was in the hallway, and her body was partially decomposed. Anyway, my agent listed it, and the question was, should we div divulge those things or not? Are they material facts? Well, not according to the law. But good business practices would say that, you know, they're going to find out, you know, as soon as they put it under contract, they might sneak over there one evening, just kind of walk around it, peek in the windows, whatever. And the neighbors are going to run over there and say, oh, hey, are you going to be our new neighbors? And guess what happened in this house? Yeah, you know, they, they had to carry her out in pieces or something. <laughs> I don't know. These buyers were from New York. They didn't care. They owned it for about two years and then called us and relisted it because they, you know, got a better job offer somewhere else. You know, they were upperly mobile type people. Um, but they appreciated the fact that we revealed to them uh, what had happened in the house and we didn't try to hide anything. Well, that got us another whole commission. It was great. But who can be held liable? Well, the owners only, not the agent. No, no. For, no, no yeah. Um, B, the owner and the agent both, of course. You know, if you know something and it's material fact, you got to disclose it. Even if the owner doesn't want you to, you got to convince them, look, we can't do that. We have to disclose material facts. The agent only, not the owner, and neither the agent nor the owner. Okay. Well, our situation about the debt property, was that a material fact? No, but we disclosed it anyway. Why? Because we felt like it was a good business practice. So you have things you must reveal and things that you could reveal and things that you don't have to reveal because we have a state law that says that you don't have to reveal stigmatized properties. But you have to decide whether that fits your overall business plan and the way you want to do business or your broker does. They'll, they'll let you know. Okay, so let's go to the next one, please. Even if there's no written agency agreement, a licensee could create dual agency by. There's no written agreement but you could create dual agency by a hearing with the commission. Yeah, you don't want one of those, but that has nothing to do with this particular transaction other than they're regulating it and making sure it was done right. Company policy, uh, establishing a relationship with both the buyer and the seller. Okay, so if you have this tight relationship with, with both, uh, even though there's no written agreement with one of the parties, uh, it, you know, it, it might be ruled dual agency. Okay, so the correct answer to this one is C, and it's not working at an open house. You know, I mean, you can even hold open houses uh, for other companies if you wanted to. I mean, if, if you have a real small brokerage, uh, maybe you don't have enough agents to cover uh, open houses. Maybe you have one or two contractors that work with you, and uh, maybe, maybe you let other companies hold them open for you. I mean, that's, that's fine as long as everyone agrees to that. Um, but this... 
you know, uh, we are lucky in Utah uh, because of everything that's been happening with, you know, nationally speaking, in particular California rulings. Uh, in Utah, for many, many years, we've required written agreements from both the seller and the buyer. You know, we're one of the few states that did. So to us, it's not uncommon. It's not, it's not even that hard to do, you know, I mean, because you have to, you have a buyer's contract and you have a seller's contract. Okay. Go to 19, please. A potential buyer comes to an open house and they meet the seller's agent. Okay. Seller's agent should do what? Immediately tell the buyer of their agency relationship with the seller. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, establish an agency relationship with the buyer. Mm, not immediately. Maybe later. I mean, you could represent both, but you know, they just came to your open house. Okay. I mean, they may not, you know, I've had a lot of people come in and say, well, I, I, I don't need an agent. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, you know? <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I'm sure you know all about contracts, you know, and a lot about real estate too. Okay. Establish your relationship with a buyer. Wait until closing. Disclose agency relationships. Come on, dumb. Keep the agency agreement private. Okay, those last two are throwaways, okay? It's either got to be immediately tell the buyer, which you do, or establish the agency relationship with the buyer, which you could. But um, when they first walk through the door, they may not even like the house. They may not even like it. Oh, yuck, yuck, yuck. Who could even, you know, I hate this house, you know. It won't work for us. It's not quite set up the way we need it. We're looking for something like this, okay? Now, practically speaking, uh, for those of you that love to hold open houses, okay, the A is the correct answer on this one, but uh, if you like to hold open houses, you need to have what I call a quick speak inventory. So they walk in that house and they don't like it. Oh man, you don't like this one. Well, what are you looking for? Well, we're looking for something like this. And Ooh, hey, I know one like that that's over here um you know that i could show you a little later i mean i'll be out of here in about an hour if you want to come back and and you know i'll make arrangements to go and show that house to you and and there's another one that you might want to see also that i'm familiar with oh and i even know about one that's not on the market yet you know and they're elbowing each other says honey this agent even knows about secret inventory <laughs> you know we need to work with this guy you know and it was a for sale by owner okay but it's really not on the market, but, you know, it's kind of for sale by owner, but it's not on the market like we call it the market, you know, where other agents can get information on it. And it's all over the Internet and everything else. OK, so the potential buyer, meet him at an open house. You got to tell him that you're working for the seller. I mean, it's kind of silly. I mean, you walk into Nordstrom's. They're so nice. They have the Nordstrom's name badge on, you know, I mean, and, uh, you know, they help you pick out shirts, ties. I mean, it's great, you know. But is there any doubt who they work for? Really? They work for Nordstrom's, even though they're all wonderful, you know, and they're very helpful. But in real estate, even though our name's on the sign, stuck in the lawn in front of the house, <laughs> and we got to tell them, oh, you may have noticed my name on the sign in front of the house. I'm working for the seller. Okay. You got to tell them because we don't want them to get confused. All right. Next one, please. So tell them right, right away. Immediately after the purchase agreement is signed, a buyer obtains a what? Do they do they get a quit claim deed? They haven't even bought it yet. Controlling interest, equitable title, or occupation rights, right to move in? No. Guys, they get something that we call equitable title. It's under contract, so they have the right to buy it, but it hasn't closed yet. So during that period of, of um, you know, where it's an escrow, um, You need to work out all the problems. Now, this is why I want you to order that title commitment early. You know, the day you list the property, I want you to get a title commitment. Why? Because if there's a title problem, it's probably going to take a week or two to fix it. I had one with the lady on that house up on 39th I mentioned earlier, and I had to hire a, a skip tracer to find the buyer. I mean, just because you bought a house from someone doesn't mean they're going to send you a Christmas card every year or keep in touch with you. You just bought their old house, you know. Anyway, we found them and they were very happy to cooperate and uh, sign the documents that were needed to release that old second mortgage on the house that had been paid off years ago. Okay. Okay. Our next question in, um, in submits an offer to buy O's property. Cool. O submits a counter offer to N. Now, when you counter an offer, 
a counteroffer is a, a uh, refusal or a cancellation of the offer. You know, I'm, I'm not accepting that offer, but I would do this, you know. Um, okay, is it executory? Is it executed? Is it canceled or is it outstanding? Well, when you submit a counter, it cancels the offer, the original offer. So I've often, you know, made emphasis on that to a seller and have them change their mind about um, countering, you know. If I remember correctly, that whole thing was over a used refrigerator. You know, the buyer wanted the refrigerator, you know, and we were talking about it and talking about it. And sometime during that conversation, the wife came to the realization that she could get on dip with the new fridge, <laughs> the steel, just by including the old refrigerator with the, with the transaction. Now, the customs change from one area to another. Here in Utah, generally speaking, we take the refrigerators and the washer and dryers. You go east, uh, Oklahoma, and well, not that's not really east, but Alabama, and, you know, some of the southern states, and you know, they leave all the appliances. You know, the, in uh, New York, why would we want all those old appliances? You know, we just don't buy all new stuff for the new house, <laughs> or we'll just take the ones we get in the new house. Okay, but um, the correct answer to this one is not executory; it's not executed; it is canceled. That original offer is canceled the moment you fill out the um counter proposal and you know i tell the seller look now we can't go king's x king's x i'll take that first offer they may not want to make that offer again you know and uh so if you want to counter that's fine but but do we really want to counter for use rich oh we paid 900 dollars for that fridge you know how many years ago 12 <laughs> okay what's on its last legs anyway it's probably going to need a new fridge well, this is an example of what you're going to get out of our live review series. And we have a number of these videos out there. And I love how the fact that we dig into the questions, because many of these questions, you're going to see the same concepts when you're sitting down for the exam. It won't be the exact word for word question, but, but the concepts are the same. You know, and so mainly it's what you're trying to do is to eliminate the obvious wrong ones and that betters your chance. Like in this one, you know, I mean, we were able to, you know, to it, it wasn't executed and it wasn't outstanding or it was a kind of maybe executory, but it was definitely canceled when you made the counter proposal, okay? So that's kind of how you go through the exam, you know? And uh, if there's a question that that is, is, is killer, um, there are a few questions on the exam not that many, but they test test questions. You know, so if there's been a law change and whatnot, they will hire someone to write test questions for them, and uh, and then and then they will try them out just to see how they test. So there could be four or five questions uh, over and above, you know, the eighty that you have to take in uh, on the national because they're trying them out, you know, and then they, and they try out the state questions as well to just to see how they they test. And if uh, if it's consistent with everything else, uh, then they're OK. And, you know, the, these companies like Pearson View have to defend their contracts, you know, and say our test is fair. You know, well, one of the things they do to make sure that their tests are fair is they have a certain number of questions that are always on the test. They're the same exact ones. It's around 25 or so. And if the state comes back and said, wow, you had an extra hard test this month, you know, our passing rates were horrible. You know, so there was a problem with your exam. What they will do to defend their exam is they'll pull out those 25 questions and they'll just grade based on that. And if the grade is consistent with the applicant scoring on the other test, you know, the, the, the big test, Look, if they flunk the big test, but then they flunk the 25 tests, the test questions, uh, then they say, well, you know, they just were a not very well prepared applicant. <laughs> so that's how they defend their test. And uh, so if we can get those 25 concepts pounded in your head, 
Uh, we're happy campers here at the Institute of Real Estate Education. Hey, watch some more of our live reviews. They're going to be very, very helpful for you when you get to the point where you need to pass that exam. And don't be a stranger. Hey, my number is 801-556-8000. That's 801-556-8000. That is my secret cell phone number. And if you want to call me, go ahead and call. I'm happy to help you any way that I can. Appreciate you guys being with us in our live exam review tonight. We have these every other Monday, and we have many, many, many of them recorded. So you can just, you know, cram away to your heart's content. Uh, hey, get out there, get your license. We're entering into a great market. Uh, you know, I mean, all the stuff you hear about the economy being good or the economy being bad, or you know, we're election year and all this other stuff. It all has a, you know, it all has an impact on things. But um, one thing for sure is as the economy gets dicey around the rest of the country, or we see a lot of confusion, or we see a lot of uh, rioting or whatever, people sell their properties and they move back to Utah. <laughs> so, you know, we do well in a bad market. You know, people come home, you know. I mean, you know, they send their kids to BYU or they send them to uh, University of Utah or any of our number of our other universities and colleges they find their sweetheart, they get married, and they stay in Utah. <laughs> and so they don't go back to California. So, you know, the family says, well, home is where the grandkids are, honey. We need to move to Utah. So, hey, get your license in Utah and get ready because we're going to have an influx of people and business is going to be great. Appreciate you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for watching. If you want to show some appreciation to our instructors, be sure to like and subscribe so that they see how much you've enjoyed it. And if you want any additional review material, check the links below for our full suite of practice materials for the real estate license exam. Thank you.